Uh, good morning, everybody. The being uh, 902 on Wednesday, May 12th, we call the Human Services Committee to order. We have a couple of heavier items at the tail end of the, uh, the agenda today that I would like to make sure we leave enough time to get to. So I'm going to try and move reports along um, at a rapid rate this morning. Right now, who do we have with it? Would you like to call attendance? There we go. Alan. Alan President. Bates. Devist. Igbo. Hello, can anybody hear me? Is this Miss Bates? Hello? Miss Bates? I'm not getting any sound. Okay, that's Miss Bates. Mavis, can you hear us? No sound. Mavis. Mavis, can you hear us? Lewis? Bates is here. Lewis here. Thank you. Shepro? Shepro here. And Surges. So you have five. Just to make sure, let's, let's just do this one more really quick. Yeah, because the audio wasn't on the whole time or something. Mr. Davis, is that you? Yeah, yes. Okay, was, thank you. Me, I was like, yep. I Dr. Igbo? Deb, I see your icon, but we didn't hear you. Are you there? Oh, sure. I am here. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Perfect. Great. Thanks. So we're, ju we're just missing Mo. Mo, are you on? Okay, we have enough to for quorum. Okay, do I have a motion to approve the minutes from the April fourteenth meeting? Zoom. Enter your meeting ID followed by pound. <laughs> <laughs> Alan moves. Kenyon moves. Alan second. Is there any discussion? Let's roll call that, please. Alan. Alan. I. Bates. Davist? Davis, yes. Kenyon? Yes. Lewis? Yes. Miss Bates? They're approved, yes. I will bet she's trying to reattach. So, but when, uh, motion passes. Thank you. Any public comments online or in the or in person? Seeing none. Monthly financial reports are on file. Anybody have any questions or comments regarding the financials? Mr. Chairman Bates here. I had to dial in, I don't know why. Say that again, Mavis. Um, I had to dial in on my phone to hear anybody, but I am here. Perfect. Thank you. Jake, why don't we go to the Veterans Ass Assistance Commission? Yes, thank you. Good morning. Um, I know you want to keep things moving along this morning, so I'd be happy. It's a pretty standard report. I'd be happy to just take questions, or if you'd like me to present it, I can do that as well. Jake, before we start, I just want to, uh, I may have mentioned this at the last meeting, and I want to make sure that we uh, keep this at the forefront, but uh, the Veterans Assistance Commission had an advocate come forward asking the entire board to remove, uh, to, to review the salaries and compensation for the department. Um, we are moving through with that in the finance committee and putting that together, not through this committee. And I just wanted to make sure that, that Jake, I mean, eye contact here between you and I, and, and it is nice mm -hmm. to see you in person again, sir. Um, I just want you to be assured that that has not fallen off the plate in any way, shape or form but I think it's more appropriate to go through finance and, and bring it along that way than to do it through here. Um, any questions on that at all? Or? I'm not the least bit concerned about it. There you go. Thank you, sir. Um, any comments for Jake on the uh, Veterans Assistance Commission? Um, I know you guys have been beat up a little bit, not you, but the VA is, is getting you know, a couple of lumps in the press lately regarding some of the post-corona thing. Is there anything to be concerned about there that you that's going to affect getting 
services and goods out to our people? Not uh, locally, with the exception of uh, there's still a pretty big delay. It's not within the VA, but uh, a partner federal agency, the National Personnel Records Center, that maintains uh, records for veterans before the year about 2000. Uh, there's still a pretty big delay for those, and you'll, you'll see that in the, the first chart. Some of those uh, days pending, um, average days of completion on the claims are still up there, and that's still a result of not having folks in that big warehouse being able to get the files and scan them to the VA. That's, that's my biggest concern right now. And, and I know there, there is absolutely nothing that Jake and his department can do about that. It's not like you can call the IT staff. This is literally people are not back in that warehouse walking down, you know, grabbing the box off the shelf and pulling the records. And uh, I, I don't have a fix for that in any way, shape, or form, but I appreciate your patience and you communicating to our veterans the, the problem that exists there. So, Absolutely. Jake, thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Jamie, why don't you come up to the podium and walk us through the Blue Cross Blue Shield invoices. Um, I have not seen these yet, but I'm curious to see. There was a couple of months that we had some erroneous billing or should I say weren't billed and we were catching up and how that has played out if, if we've trued up on that or not. So those have been trued up now. Um, it's, it's a little easier to visualize. Jamie, hang on. It's a little easier to visualize if you go to the group alternatives report um, where you can see that uh, January was very low. And Blair, then, can you pop us under the group alternatives report there? Two down. There you go. <clears throat> in here and then scroll down one more one more yep that's the one there we go so you can see where january was extremely low um and some of that had to do with that billing error it is finally caught up um march was high if you look at the orange band at the bottom that's claims so claims were up, but uh, the reason it was so considerably high also was that they caught up that, um, if you look at the yellow bar, that is almost nothing in January. That one's quite large here in these next couple months. That was them catching up the billing error. That was within that yellow bar. So for committee, for committee members, it's not like we were the healthiest people in the world in December and January there was truly a Blue Cross billing glitch that occurred. <clears throat> and it's not like our people got sick in February. It just caught up. Correct. So it's just a true up on that. Yes. <clears throat> Perfect. So are, are we within tolerance on our expectations? For, Blair, go back to this month's bill. On the left-hand side, go up to one more. There we go. So we're with back within tolerance on this one? Yes, we are. I mean, this one is high, but that's because we were catching up that billing error. So we should return to normal billing amounts next month. That'll and and our normal standard. billing amounts that Jamie and I see are typically mm -hmm. 1.2, 1.4. So yes. you, when you see a 1.6, you, you throw caution, say, w w what's going on? Correct. That's that adjustment line um, that says 380, 783. Yeah. Correct. Perfect. All right, why don't we go on to, if, are there any questions on the Blue Cross Blue Shield? Let's go on to item B, the MERP information. Fifty-nine members, are we up a couple from last month? Uh, yeah, I believe it's up just a few. Okay, I think 54, 54, 55 is kind of our number. We're at 59, nothing to be of any concern about here. Um, unless you feel differently? No, nothing to be concerned about. Perfect. Questions, comments? The group alternatives report. Again, we kind of just went through this. Uh, Jamie, is there any anomalies other than the, the, the billing uh, that we identified? No, there were no anomalies. Okay. Are we going on to item, any questions on that? I'm so sorry. Why don't we go to item D, applicants and staff changes. Um, I believe we should see a leveling off of the uh, erratic nature that we saw during the election cycle that really skews this and everybody goes, oh my gosh, we're, you know, how many people are we losing? How many people are we hiring? No, it's just election judges that really throws off the numbers. Without that, are we within tolerance and 
Yes, there's there's been a little movement. I think it just has to do with new elected officials and things. And there's just been some some movement, some changes in positions, new positions approved. But um, yeah, everything looks pretty status quo. Okay, and and just a reminder to everybody, one of the byproducts of this report was making sure that the recommendation went to the full board. Um, that if we're just replacing somebody we don't need to beat this up every time. It, there was an employee there that left and we hired another person to put into that spot that doesn't require hours of debate. It's, it's just a change. We're not creating or adding a new position. We're just making a replacement for a vacancy that occurred. And, and we appreciate having this each month to be able to review. Any questions or comments on that? Mr. Chairman, Deborah? Hi, Ms. Allen. Hi. Um, I don't think I can remember the last time we added a new position. Um, this is just a routine thing that we do to make sure that everybody is following the rules of not adding. Of course, we also haven't been uh, getting rid of positions either, I don't believe. I mean, um, we talk about how um, uh, a way to lower the work staff is to not replace when people um, leave or retire, but um, I don't think we do that either. So it kind of balances, right? I, I agree with you, Deb. It's, um, however, I remember when, you know, again, I've only been here two and a half years, but I remember when the reports came through at the board level um, and, and in finance committee that I was very confused as to what the reports were saying. Hi, we're being asked to approve this. Well, what do we have to approve? A director had a vacancy and filled it. Um, and, and I'm not, this is, maybe this is just me personally, but I didn't necessarily understand that um, until I began getting into this report, at which point I understood the correlation and, it's, and I just wanna make sure that I'm communicating that that correlation um, isn't a situation where anybody's being added. That was just my inability to read it properly and understand it at the time. Karina, are you following me on that? I am. I, I, we would get I, these things saying, I hey, we're, we're hiring somebody. And we're just like, we're it, not. We're just replacing a vacancy. It's just a replacement. And uh, to um, Deb Allen's comments, uh, the new appointment has been the public information officer, but that position is still open. So that has been this year was approved by the board to hire, but I have not, uh, so, um, we're still in search. Okay, and that's, I wasn't going in any direction there at all, but, but just to, thank you. Just, so, yeah, just, yeah, just to let you very know. kind of you. <laughs> Deb, is that, is that, is that okay? Nor was I, Mr. Chairman. That's, um, we all think that's a good idea. Perfect. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Jamie, let's go on to item E, um, workers' compensation report. And again, I will, I will preface this with the board that it is, it is, and I believe I said this at the last meeting, it is unfortunate that our committee meets the day after the full board because we give you a graph that says, look at how good we're doing while we actually saw behind the curtain at workers' compensation claims that are pending and may be coming down the road. And that's a really tough swing to, to, in your mind, say, well, Cliff, how are you saying this the day after when just the day before it was all doom and gloom? Okay, it's, it's a long process. And, and what you're looking at is actually what's been closed and some of these have been open for quite some time. And what you, we reviewed as board members yesterday are things that may not come across our desk for another 18 months. Sorry, Jamie. And that's true. I mean, some of the settlements discussed were for dates of injury that were for years before. So when those amounts do hit, they will hit in previous years because that is based on the date of the incident um, and not the date of the settlement. So when those do hit, they might hit in previous years, not necessarily in this year, even though those amounts were paid out this year. Um, so when you look at the reports and you look at this year, um, current years are naturally going to be lower than past years because many of those things haven't closed and settled yet. Um, but as we trend and we look at the number of claims um, and the claims that have closed, we are continuing to trend downward. 
Looks like Court Services is our big winner this month. Court Services did have an incident that occurred um, in the Juvenile Justice Center that did result in a few injuries to employees that are being managed. Is, is that under assault? Is that? Uh, it's either under assault or under human. I, I'm not sure, probably I, under assault. Okay, and, and, and if, you know, if I can make a comment, which may be out of line, but there are only things, there are only so many things that we can control. Correct. Other things are inherent. So, so an officer that is in pursuit, a juvenile detention uh, individual that, you know, having trouble with somebody, I, I mean, these are things that are inherent to the job and that's why we have workers' compensation. And we wanna make sure that we're doing the very best we can to be there for our employees at the time that they need us. On the other hand, the things that we can control such as slip and falls, and, and stuff like that. We, I mean, we've done everything we can, we're continue to do it, but you're gonna see these blips and, and oh, that's why we're here, so. Fair? Correct. Okay. Anything else on these? Any questions or comments from the committee? Let's go on to item 7A, monthly training report. All right, it looks like uh, we have made huge ground on our sexual harassment training compliance. Am I reading that wrong? No, you're correct. We have um, almost 900 of 1,200 employees are completed already. Wait, and it's, what, what's the date? <laughs> it's May. Is this September already? <laughs> so we've done really well on that, and we can't say thank you enough to everybody. Um, last month, we discussed a small... Um, uh, I don't want to use the term glitch, but our system was designed so that if you completed something but didn't check the right box, they weren't being notified. They were continuing to be notified as if they hadn't completed that. Was there any action on that? When that happens um, and the person who's receiving those lets us know, we do hand remove those notifications. Okay. So if they don't check the right box when they go through it, then it doesn't necessarily mark them done, but they can then send their um, proof into human resources, and then we just hand remove them from that list. So did we have a whole bunch that we hand removed, like hundreds, or did people really take No, them? I think there were only a couple. That's wonderful. It's not very many. Spectacular. Anything else on compliance? Nope. Perfect. I don't have anything under old business at this time. If there's any members of the committee that have, I invite you to bring it forward right now. It's going once. Going twice, gone. New business. Um, for item A, the 2022 medical insurance company choice, Mike Baker's team reached out to me from group alternatives and said, and asked, how aggressive do you want us to be in terms of shopping the insurance for the county? And, and Michelle, feel free to bop me on the head if I stroll stray on this one. Um, and I said, Mike, that's a great question that's far reaching because every time we get, it, it seems that every time we get near contract negotiations, the health insurance component seems to be a sticking point. And Michelle Nierman and I took conference with Jeremy. <coughs> Jeremy, Edelson. Jeremy Edelson, one one of our union negotiators, and spoke with Jeremy and, and asked him point blank, you know, give us some guidelines on this. What are our rules? Where do we want to go with this? And 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 from my perspective, I believe it's our role at, at this committee to shop our insurance as diligently as possible to make sure that we have the best rates that we can going forward. Yet at the same time, we don't want to upset the apple cart to the point where the employees lose faith in what we're doing. And each time that we've come forward to say, here's one carrier versus another carrier versus a third carrier, the unions have always pushed back dynamically saying, 
hey, listen, there's going to be such an upheaval with this. There's going to be um, such a disruption in coverage. There's going to be such a, and, and I want to be sensitive to that. The reality is, and, and Jamie and, or if Joe Onsick is on or, or somebody from finance, the reality is that due to the COVID or not, we have been able to hold our rates to our employees extremely stable if not reduce them in some small way. We have been able through Mike Baker's team to increase coverages and benefits to our employees, not dramatically, but we didn't diminish them. So we are at a win-win across the boards in so many ways that it kind of doesn't make sense to upset the apple cart on this aggressively. Remember, the employees have seen such a change from the county two years ago being with the, the cooperative, IPBC, and then going solo, meaning the county engaging with the carrier directly. We then took it from a 12 month period that wasn't a 12 month policy period that was not in line with the rest of the world, if you will, open enrollment. And we stretched ours to an 18 month open and uh, contract period to better align with everything else in claims. In and of itself, those two things are asking a lot. We went to a carrier and said, can you give us prices for 18 months? And they basically said, we're not doing it. And we pushed back with every bit of muscle we had, ultimately received it, things went well. I say we let that contract run, negotiate the union contracts, we had a couple of other items within these contracts that, that, that we've been looking at. And one of them was the notion that right now we have a 1783 split between the portion that the employee pays and the portion that the, the county pays. Within that split, we found that, that it was an aggregate 1783. And Michelle, again, bought me as needed. We had an aggregate 1783, meaning not each employee was paying a pure 1783. One group may have been paying, you know, 8020s, and, and but you put them all together, and it was 1783. We don't believe that that was necessarily where we wanted to go into the future. We wanted it to be a pure 1783, and over the past couple of years, through Mr. Onzik's team, we have. I don't want to use the term clean that up, but tighten that up a little bit to the point where this year's rates are truly 1783. Now, all in all, I've not heard one complaint from an employee any place, but that does mean that there has been tweaks in the amount that people have had to pay out of their paychecks. And, and for us at a committee level, this is all hypothetical, but when you're an employee and you open your paycheck and say, wow, there was $1,000 last week and this week there's only $950, you noticed something was different. Or, wow, I have an extra $75, what happened? Well, your health insurance rates went down. All in all, we've done a fabulous job and we need to continue doing that because, and Jamie, help me if I'm wrong with this, but the only complaints that we heard in human services was that there was a major disruption in the pharmaceutical um, program that we used because IPBC used one, Blue Cross Direct used another, and those formularies weren't identical. They weren't good or bad, better or worse. They were just different. But if you were one of the employees who's, um, I, I use a Libre monitor, for example. My monitor isn't, for my diabetes, my monitor isn't pharmacy. It's durable medical. Well, when you change between formularies, that could change, and it did. Inconvenience, disruption, surely. And did we hear from people about that? Absolutely. A minimal number of people, and nobody who got the additional benefits called and said thank you. <laughs> it's just one of those things. It was just different. I believe that we can tighten that and that's where we should be spending our energy along with the dental program and not being aggressive with the 
overarching medical insurance through Blue Cross Blue Shield. But that's not my choice. It is mine to bring to you to ask you your opinion so we can get back with Mike Baker's team. And, and again, rather than give opinion, we took the time to speak with our union negotiators to say what enhances us and where would we like to go, understanding that part of their negotiations might be, hey, we don't want it 1783 anymore. We want you guys paying for a little bit more than you used to. And we would like to be able to say, but we're doing you know, all we can to maintain what we have without any increase. And Michelle, am I fair in saying that so far? Okay. So with that, I would like to open it up for discussion and just say, you know, what are we thinking? Mr. Kenyon, I'm staying at an hour. I am. Yeah. Okay. You were move along. I'm just. I'm moving, but I moved right to these. So in this, is there any discussion on this whatsoever? I'm, I'm looking to give a recommendation out of this committee. Um, and, and I'm not sure if I would have to bring this to finance or bring this to the board, or if I just bring it back to Mike Baker's team and say, this is the direction I believe we'd like to go. Okay. Louis on the line. Hi. Anita, did you want to speak? Yes. Go ahead. Um, so this is my um, third year um, with this committee and also probably the third year that we've gone through presentations on health insurance and everything. And um, I think the 18 month that we just went through has been great as um, you said, nobody has complained. A few people have minor tweaks, mainly on the prescription. Um, the county has very good insurance, very good benefits and good plans. Um, and that's one of the draws of coming to this county. And um, every year when we renegotiate, people get nervous that their doctors, their people, their things are gonna switch. So I think it's, it's um, to the benefit of our employees and stability to just go forward as we are. And Anina, I would add that, and, and I thank you so much for the comment. I would add that I would like the negotiators to build in language into the union contracts that don't put us at the disadvantage if we'd like to change. I mean, as long as we're changing to like, kind, and quality coverage, we, we shouldn't be at the behest of the unions if we can get that less expensive someplace else. And, and I don't know that the language that we have gives us that maneuverability. So, so that's the fight I'd like to have, not the carrier fight right now. I don't know if that makes sense. Gotcha, gotcha. Kareen, you're giving me that look again. I was, uh, yes, I'm just curious um, and listening to this for the very first time. Um, pharmaceutical, obviously the cost of uh, your prescription drugs, very critically important, whether or not it's a, uh, it's a, a name brand or not. Um, there's a big variety of opportunities for that. Um, the dental though is also incredibly important. And I would advocate wherever we look for dental plans, whether, whatever costs they are, that the most robust coverage is allowed to our employees. Uh, because if we all know that teeth are the um, harbinger of good health. And if you have bad gums, uh, decay, that can affect your re the rest of your body. Uh, so I want to ensure that we have a robust dental program. Uh, agreed. And those, and those two items would be the thrust of Mike Baker's um, research for us right now is, is the formulary for the Rx and as well as the dental program. That's where we'd like him to, I mean, if we're giving direction, that's where we want you to focus. And then back to the Muchin team to say, clean up that language to give us some flexibility. Should we next year come back and say, we're going to look at this. We don't want to buck heads or feel like we're doing something wrong to our employees. So get it built in. Thank you. Okay. Anita, thank yeah, you so much. Anybody else? Mark, go ahead. Yeah, you've touched on a lot of important elements there as Chairman Pirag did also. Um, the language that allows us to shop is critically important. And, you know, the labor management team and Lanier Muchin should absolutely work on it. I guess direction to Mike Baker and team, you know, for me is, you know, 
we're the cub and you're the mama bear. You, you know, you should always be looking and protecting us and be a ground to railing the cage of the employees every year. But the carriers out there need to know that we're looking, we're shopping, and that we're willing to change. So, you know, no, I don't want to change every year and, and have everybody, you know, always in an uproar about what's going to happen with my coverage. But on the other side of it, where we do battle with the carriers and, and Mike Baker on our behalf, you have to be aggressive and you have to always be looking. Agreed, Mark. And I, and I think the battle to get the language built into the union contracts gives our swords, you know, sharpens our swords, gives us some teeth, if you will, um, yes. to, then, to then be able to go back in earnest to say, we're not bluffing this time, we're shopping. Put your best deal on the table. Because right now, I, I, you know, right now our hands sometimes get tied behind our back. So which battle do we want to fight? Both. Well, that's not necessarily real. Let's, let's run the 18 months. Let's tighten the union you know, uh, a language that would allow us to go shop in earnest and then set ourselves up to succeed the next round is, is kind of where I'm going. But thank Bates, you. Please. Go ahead, Mavis. Bates, please. Um, so the question of should we be aggressive in our you know, search, I, I think that always has to be yes. Um, but I understand you don't want to change things too much. Is that the problem? You don't want to scramble the eggs too much? Um, I, I think that from the employee's perspective, and I don't want to speak out of line here, but there is an apprehension that exists for somebody that's been with us. I mean, we, we search for the, you know, the best and the brightest. And when we get them here, we want to make sure that we're offering them the very best that we can. So, mm -hmm. so when it comes to their health insurance, people protect that you know, for their families. Yeah. It's not so much for them, but for their children, for their spouses. And, and when you have something that says, Honestly, if we switch from this carrier to that carrier, that doc, your doctor starts you, all over again. Okay, yeah, it might not sense. be available and that's going to be a disruption. And you know what? Employees don't like that. They, but, they, and I like what Mark said that what, whoever we are with right now, they better give us the best deal. Uh, and, and they're really, you know, I'd, I'd really like to spend more time focusing on Blue Cross to say, this is what we need to be able to use some of our wellness information to help our staff and, and really sharpen the sword in that arena rather than worrying about, well, you know, don't worry because you're only going to be here 12 months and then we're going to shop you. No, we have an opportunity right now to really do some good. It's just a little bit different mentality than we've had in the past, but I think it sets us up better. Okay, thanks. That sounds good. Anyone else? Mr. Martin. I, I agree with everything you've said, but I wanna reiterate or emphasize the fact that anybody who has ever dealt with group health insurance over the years knows that periodically you've got to change companies. Agreed. Uh, and, and, and so that needs to always be in our holster of activities because you can go to Blue Cross or Blue Shield or Aetna or anybody else. And after a while they just start the rates go up and then miraculously, if you leave them uh, two years later, they come back and, Oh my gosh, the rates are less. It, it's, and that's not unfair to employees. It just gives us the opportunity, not only to operate economically, but to, but to continue to provide them the best money we can in an environment where we're always looking for money here. So we just have to always have that in mind. And I, I, I agree. We owe it to our taxpayers to do that. Agreed, but just so we are absolutely clear, we have not only lowered the cost to the county dramatically, but we have held the line on the cost to our employees without an additional cost to the county I, as for I years, said, I'm, and, and, I'm, uh, for, the, for the past year and a half going forward. I'm another, agreeing and I'm complimentary okay. to everything that's been done. I'm just- I love you, brother. Saying that we, we can't forget. I, I agree, and, and, I, and, and to reiterate, Putting teeth in the contract language allows us to go at this differently. Uh, um, and, and, and I believe that that's where it's at. So anybody else? Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is Deborah. Hi, Deb. Hi. Um, 
this, there, there's an anomaly that I just want to mention. Uh, for a while in our law office, I changed insurance every year for this reason. The introductory year was always less. The second year made up for the break they gave you in the introductory year. So it's like you had to you had to either make a decision that you were going to try and stay with a company because you believed in them and they didn't do anything terrible to to skewer you, or you literally had to change every year um, in order to just get the best rate for one year, knowing that the next year they would uh, catch up with you. So sometimes it's better sometimes to stay the course. I don't know. I don't think we have any leverage over Blue Cross Blue Shield to uh, to threaten them too much. I, I am not aware of any complaint that has come to the department or to the committee against Blue Shield, Blue Cross Blue Shield's coverage in any way, shape, or form. And I think they have been nothing but exemplary for us um, in, in this snapshot in time. So just for what it's worth. And, and, and whether keeping the rates steady and, and even lowering them a bit, whether that was because of the COVID or not, I, I don't know that it matters to us. The bottom line is the results were the same. We, you know, we kept the rates where they were, you know, for an extended period of time. That's a win to me, so. Exactly, Mr. Chairman. Um, and if I can continue, it's not just the union people. It's, our, it's, it's everyone in the county. Well, maybe not everyone, but lots, lots of our employees are grateful, for the, for, are grateful for the continuation. Agreed. And, and again, I do not want anybody in any way, shape, or form to think that this, um, this is some magic. Um, this, is, this is sweat, blood, tears, hard work from Mike Baker's team who makes it look so incredibly easy for us. So um, we appreciate Mike and, and all they do. Okay, with nothing else there, uh, Kareen. One, one last you... one. Okay, sorry, sure. Mark. Um, but I'll keep it quick because I don't want to make the farmer mad. Kenyon's looking um, at you really squinting. I so. know. I, I, I could feel it. Okay. The, uh, over the years, um, conversations that I've had with Carl Tannenberg, you know, and through the labor management part of this, and, and something that we should try to gently introduce or reintroduce into that conversation in the negotiations is the concept of being able to address the the split, the 83-17. There are many places in the world that operate on an 80-20. And I'm, I'm not suggesting that it's an easy path or that you could go straight to that, those numbers, but the idea that it's at least introduced as as one of the tools in the box in the future was something that Carl and I used to talk about at labor management and should be kept at least there, you know, in the background that it could someday be part of the negotiation. Cause that's a huge, you know, dollar wise, that's a huge deal. That was Mark, it. I'm done, Mike. <laughs> totally agreed. And, and that conversation has already begun just to let you know. Oh, good. So, Okay, Kareen well, again. Me, on, well, yes, Ms. Would, Bates. Uh, quick question. I hope uh, would that have to go through a union negotiation? Oh yeah. Eighty twenty. Okay. Oh gosh, yes. That, that would be cataclysmic in some ways. I. It's only three percent, it, but. It's a big deal. Yep. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> cataclysmic would probably be an understatement, but yes. Um, and Mavis, it was so nice to see you in person yesterday. Thank you. Um, and Kareen, I, I, I do not know, John, I, I don't know the correct way to take this out of this committee. Where, where, if, if we're making a recommendation like this, do we make it to the executive board or do we just go straight to Mike Baker's team? I don't know where the authorities lie and we can come back to this. We, I mean, we can by all means we're not under a gun on this. We are months ahead of this. Um, so I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm reaching out and asking. I don't know. That's great for us to say in this committee, yay, now what? Where do we go from here? Um, it, it, Let's go John first. Well, this isn't, I'm not considering myself a procedural expert. I'm not considering myself a procedural expert, but what you're doing is 
trying to get to a consensus, are you not to give Mike Baker instructions as to how to review the insurance coverage? Correct. I wouldn't think that would have to go any farther than this committee getting okay. that. And then when you get that conclusion, then you'd make a recommendation. Okay. And then you can ask somebody that knows what they're talking about to whom you should make it. <laughs> Kareen? <laughs> I'm not sure if I know, but <laughs> I would suggest, I would agree. If it's by consensus, do the research and then bring it up to the executive committee. Um, okay. And I think that would be the appropriate looking at uh, state's attorney. Then I believe the way we've been doing this is to say, um, are there any nays to consensus on, on the discussion? Hearing none, let's move on to item B. Uh, Penny, would you like to come to the podium? And if I could, if I could just uh, lay some groundwork for this, Penny and I had a very brief conversation down in her office. Um, you know, she's new to the position. She's you know, reviewing some information, and and she had some questions. And I said, "Welcome to committee, and let's just tell me where you want to go." <clears throat> Fair. Close okay. enough. Close enough. We'll go. We'll go with that. Um, so. Uh, we are currently conducting a PCARD audit in every aspect of PCARDs, starting with the policy and moving on to transactions from the last uh, fiscal year. Could you tell us what PCARDs are for those of us who don't use them and don't know? Those are the purch purchasing cards that have been issued to the some employees in the county to make purchases. Okay. Credit cards? Yeah. Okay. So... Um, we're just in the beginning stages of it. It's got a lot of legs, so um, it's going to be a, quite a process, but there's a lot of information. Okay. So. And, and we're, we're not identified a problem. We're not saying there's an issue. We're just saying we have a whole ton of, we've got a crap load of credit cards out there and everybody's doing their own thing. And can we collectively buy at a, at a better rate if we just had a different process? Is, well, I, I think that's a little bit of it, but we also have a new purchasing director. Um, so John and the auditor's office have working kind of collectively to de determine the process because we have an old policy in place. Um, it's very vague, basically more about issuance of cards as opposed to how to actually properly use the cards. We've also... Um, changed over the years in the way that the county purchases products. Um, it's, it's more of an Amazon transition, um, quicker, faster, less expensive type process. So we're, we're reviewing that type of information. Um, actually pulled up yesterday that 26% of our purchases are through Amazon now. Um, so not so much of a vendor-based process, but um, that's just a small portion of what we're looking at. Um, not quite sure what we're going to find. Okay. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any questions for Penny on this? Kareen, go ahead. I'm just curious, and the outcome of this research is, what are, you, um, are we going to establish a new policy for purchasing um, so that materials... I think let's get the data and figure out what's going on, and we might make some recommendations. Yeah, uh, we, we don't know what we're going to necessarily come across. We're being new to the position, and what we're looking for at is actually from... Um, going back through 2020 um, up until it's, it's going from um, December of 2019 to December to November 30th of uh, 2020. So right before mm -hmm. I came into office and, and many of us. So we're looking at the past habits and um, potentially looking at a new policy or us giving information for the county board and, and the proper departments to look at the policy. Uh, we also, in working with John, have come to the knowledge that we may be doing using a new bank as opposed to Fifth Third. So helping us really formulate what that looks like here in the future for the county. I know at my office, at least, we used, you know, the big complaint used to be, you can't use an online service to order your copy paper because when we're out of copy paper, we need it. So give me the card, let's leave my office, let's drive down to the office, Max, let's buy our paper, let's come back. Well, let's face it, there's not much that you can't order today that you don't get tomorrow. And, and that's just different. It doesn't mean it's better or worse, it's just a different way of doing business, and I think we're just trying to address that. 
-hmm. and we wanted to bring it to committee to just say, just everybody be aware. We're just looking at it. So, I mean, we'll see where it goes. I think it's very important for the other departments to, to be aware as well, because we are looking for some, we may be looking for some information for clarification on previous purchases, um, just so that we have a, a really good picture of what's been going on in the county and make sure that we're set up here for the future of how the county makes purchases. Okay. Mr. Chairman, Alan, I have a question. Hi, Deb. Hi, uh, uh, Ms. Wegman, is there any are, is, does the county have the ability to make any money by using a particular credit card vendor? Um, I'm thinking of the commercials I see where you get um, where you get money back uh, if you make your purchases in office supplies or something like that. I'm just wondering if there's if if uh, governments are able to make any money by choosing a particular card company. Uh, that's that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, being that I'm the auditor, I don't have the information regarding that. It would be coming from finance or purchasing. Okay. Wait, we um, have a finance person in the room with her hand up. Yay. Come on up to the podium and that microphone right there. Hi. <clears throat> we Name, do actually please. receive a... Uh, Name, <laughs> We do receive a rebate from our current, um, I believe it's an annual rebate uh, from our current P card purchaser. I don't know the amount off the top of my head and I don't think it's significant, but I know there is a rebate program established with that. I think that's pretty standard for purchasing cards. Deb, does that help you? I'm always looking for opportunities. Thank you. You're the best, thanks. Mr. Uh, Kenyon. Mr. Chairman Sergis. Hang on one second, Mr. Kenyon. I had a brainwave, uh, but Menards gives you 11% back on almost everything. What happens to the, that rebate? I got, a, I got a rebate in the mail for $132. Does that go to somebody's pocket or does it go back in the till? So somebody applies for these rebates too. I know we buy a lot of stuff. Absolutely. This county. Mm -hmm. There's got to be some benefits. Yeah, we're looking. So, so just again, this is just transparent conversation. We're just opening a door here and just looking behind it. So, all set. Penny, thank you so very much. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. She didn't thanks. mention when the platinum cards for board members were coming. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, Ms. Bates. Um, I don't know what committee this should come up in, but do we have a um, like a rule to buy local whenever possible to keep our money in our community and out of the hands of uh, Jeff Bezos? I'm, I'm not capable of answering that. Kareem? That would be through purchasing. Purchasing. Okay. Great question, though. I'd love to buy local when we can. Okay, Jamie, why don't we come up to the podium here? Um, Kareem? asked a few, a little while back, if we could begin taking a look at the, uh, I'm sorry, making sure I'm on the right one. Is this the return to work one? No, this is no, the- this, I'm sorry, I'm down. out of line. Okay, why don't you just take this one? Um, this was from Joe Onzik. This originated, yes, Joe Onzik so actually originated this one. Um, the. American Rescue Plan Act was recently passed and included a provision to extend the paid time off that's similar to what was done in the Families First um, Act that allowed paid time off for people that missed work due to COVID, um, either to care for a family member for their own illness or to um, participate in a quarantine period. And unlike the FFCRA, which was mandatory, the ARPA provisions are optional. So we're asking the board to consider um, adopting those provisions. Also, unlike the FFCRA, which did not allow governmental agencies to recoup those funds through payroll tax deductions, the ARPEA does allow that. 
So any costs that we make in extending that um, coverage will be recouped out of payroll taxes. So it won't cost the county any money to um, offer these benefits to the employees. So to rise from the weeds on this, this was in the first go around, it expired. Something new has come that allows us to reinstate a very similar version and Joe has asked us to consider that to move forward. Correct, it expired on December 31st of 2020 and this was passed effective, I believe April 1st. So, um, and it's effective until September 31st. So it's just to, re to reinstate it for that temporary period in which the tax And has this been available. vetted through the state's attorney's office or attorneys? It has. Okay, and there were any modifications that were needed to pass that have been included? Correct. Super, are there, uh, Kareen? I don't see the deadline on there. Uh, I see through December 31st, 2020, but I don't see when it expires up there. And thank you for sharing that. That's just the summary. I think if you go to the actual resolution on the next page, it does include the September 30th date on there. Very good. September 30th, 2021, yes. third paragraph down. Mm -hmm. Yes, I see Second it. paragraph, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's some conversation, hang on, are we okay? There were a couple things that were added in the new one in addition to what was offered through the Families First through December, and that includes um, people offering employees paid leave to get their vaccination. Um, so that would be included. So we'd be including everything. So if you look at that exhibit, it does include everything that is included. Um, there were some other small additions. Um, there used to be an unpaid waiting period before being able to use the family coverage and they've eliminated that waiting period. So it used to be a waiting period that they had to take unpaid before they could use it. That waiting period's been eliminated and the paid time can start as soon as they need it. Okay, and again, that, that is without cost to us because is it being reimbursed? Correct, it should be reimbursed entirely by payroll tax deductions. Uh, I, I have another question uh, as we're scrolling through this quickly. Um, because now children are eligible, teenagers are eligible, does that include paid time off so that parents can go get their children vaccinated? I believe it does. It includes to assist. Can you share what where that is, please? Jamie, thank you for doing the research on this. And Michelle is coming to the podium to help out with this. We're trying to locate where this is. That is an excellent question, Madam Chair. Right now, I believe, if, I, if memory serves me, the language actually indicates that it's the employee who's getting the immunization or is recovering from uh, you know, some sort of period of illness resulting from an immunization. I don't believe it extends to family members, but we would have to look into that. Further. Okay, I think that should be included uh, because we have. Parents. I don't think it's up to us to include something that's at the federal level. Is is oh, this? this you is just would You can always do any policy you want. It just would not be reimbursable if it's not covered under the act. So we would have. I don't to know where to go with that. Oh. Um, so, and I do. And I do. And please, I realize that the standard protocol is that there is a motion, there is a second, we put this under discussion. Th these are pretty big items. We're in committee, this is where the genesis starts. By the time this moves through, we would expect it to be hammered out along the way. We're hammering right now. So it, if we need to look into this, we can do this. I, I would ask that we have a motion and second to move this forward and maybe by the next committee, if we can find that question out and if it needs to be added, we could add it at that time. Would that be appropriate? Okay. Mr. Kenyon, can I get a motion for this? I would be glad to do that. Okay, Mr. Um, Davis or Ms. Bates, um, did you? Davis second. Davis second, any discussion? That being said, I believe we're roll call. Excuse me, before we go into roll call, if I could just uh, suggest that when that policy, potential policy is researched, um, I do believe that children from age two to 
11 are going to be considered later on this year or early next year, depending on how long this policy is in place. So we may want to make sure that the language is open-ended so that includes all children and not just specific ages. And for anyone who thinks this thing is over, I have people waiting for their insurance cards at my office that didn't get them yesterday because one of our high school interns tested positive and has been asked to quarantine for at least two weeks and then test negative before he returns. This, this isn't quite done yet, folks. I mean, I know we all want to be overly excited, but wear your mask, wash your hands, be vigilant. So can we roll call, please. Alan? Alan, aye. Good admonition, Mr. Chairman. Bates? Bates, aye. Davis? Davis, yes. Kenyon? Yes. Lewis? Lewis, yes. Thank you. All right, item D, another heavy lift item uh, where, where I'd spoken out of turn before. Uh, Madam Chair had, had looked to the committee to say, I, you know, I believe that we need to put together something regarding to re the return to work. Mm -hmm. I was, um, am I out of line again? No, we're on the, retur we're on the return to work. Okay. Um, I was extremely pleased yesterday to see the participants from the county board live and in our, our boardroom. I think that sends a, a unified message um, back to everybody, but we're trying to craft something that, you know, Jamie, thank you so much, but you've got to be an octopus on this one. I mean, you've got things flying all over the place. This is what the CDC says. This is what the health department says. This is what the department's had to say. This is, so why don't you walk us through what we think we might be asking to move to the next level today? So what we tried to put together was something that would, um, provide guidelines for our department heads so that they can establish the appropriate plan that meets all the recommendations that fits their department's needs. We have such varying departments within the county from, you know, transportation to, you know, the human resources department we have such different needs. So what we really wanted to do was give the department heads the flexibility to make the plans that work best for their employees, but then provide them some pretty clear guidelines about what's required through the Department of Health and the CDC to make sure that we're still protecting our employees completely as well and making sure that they're well informed of the requirements of return to work. So the resolution itself um, does state that there, the exhibit would contain the guidelines. So that would state that the county is authorizing departments to reopen in accordance with the Restore Illinois plan and that the guidelines on the attached exhibit would be used for each department to develop their own reopening plan. So in looking at the exhibit, um, this information was taken directly from guidance provided by the Centers for Disease Control in the Illinois Department of Public Health. Um, both the state's attorney and the health department have reviewed this document. Um, I did email out um, a couple edits that the health department made that was not included in time um, for the agenda to be published. I don't know if everybody got a copy of those. There should be a printed copy available as well. It was just two small edits. Um, so if you wanna, do you wanna move to the exhibit um, that's attached? I'll kind of run through that real quick. Um, in looking at the exhibit, uh, the first heading provides guidance uh, for return to work. So their plan should include a protocol for um, self-examining for temperature and symptoms, which is pretty standard. You come in, you get your temperature taken. We're gonna continue that and their plan should include a process for that. Um, they also need to make sure that there's very clear procedures for employees who do have symptoms to call out um, so that they do not need to come into the office. And then there's clear return to work guidelines underneath. So those with COVID-19, um, when they may return to work after an infection, as well as the next bullet point, which includes um, those who had contact with someone who are quarantining. The health department did add um, a couple bullets at the bottom where they added that the local health department can adjust the quarantine period under certain circumstances. So that's the edit that they made um, to add that bullet point. 
The other edit they made was that negative tests um, do not change the guidelines unless directed by the health department. So they just wanted to make sure that they have the flexibility to make adjustments to quarantine periods as needed. Um, so those additions are um, recommended in addition to what's up here. Beyond that, um, we want all the plans created by the departments to include social distancing of workspaces, limitations of gatherings, mask wearing, um, including eligible employees to return um, that rotate staff in but maintains the necessary um, capacity restrictions as recommended by the Illinois Department of Health. Um, also, uh, employees have to be informed of all the necessary safety items and there's a workplace health and safety guidelines for business employees and staff that has to be posted and that's a poster provided by the state of Illinois. They also um, will have to update sick and family leave policies once the board makes a decision based on that COVID policy, the paid time off policy we just discussed. So we'll have to put that out once that's been approved. If that becomes approved, we'll have to add that. So when this came to my to me, my, my you know, I was discussing with with Audrey, my wife, and I said, you know what? When I go to the pistol range, I'm really good. Like I'm in the upper 10% of marksmen. And then I asked Jamie, am I shooting at the phase four, the bridge phase, or the phase five? And she kind of said, Well, you're skeet shooting now, Cliff. Just keep it moving. So when this conversation was had, we were in a different protocol than we're on the precipice of now. And we're doing the best we can. But what I want to suggest is I don't perceive this to be a hammer. This is not something that we are dropping as a blanket on top of the departments to say, get in line with this or else. This is very generic. This is very adaptive. Because while we have some departments that never left during COVID, we have some that have, you know, are, are struggling to return right now, and we're trying to make sure that this has the flexibility for those departments. Am, am I mistaken in any way, shape, or form on that? No, that's correct. It was written, you know, intending for the departments to be able to make the protocol that fits their department's needs. So, um, you know, some departments will have to have a much more robust protocol than others. Madam Chair, is this what you requested or are we off base? Uh, this is what the departments have requested mm -hmm. from the county board. Uh, my question is, uh, Jamie, you just mentioned that we will have to adjust this until the family leave policy uh, has been uh, voted upon and approved. So th should this be tabled until the family leave policy resolution is- Or maybe ask Michelle, is there some way for us to advance this and that family leave policy, however it is adopted, just becomes a part of it. How, how do we do that subject to? Yes, if you, if you want, if you would like to uh, have us review that and incorporate provisions, we can do that and then deliver that to the next committee, like a, a, the executive committee. Or I know that there was some talk about a, a potential uh, special human services committee. So perhaps we could bring that back here before the next county board meeting if that happens. It's, it's because this other act is beyond this committee's control, I would ask, pass this, move this to the next level. This is, I don't want to say that this is time sensitive, urgent, yet it kind of is. So if we could move this on, clearly understanding that if this was to go to executive next, that there may be an amendment that we recommend for that portion in executive. Would that be acceptable yeah. to everybody? Mr. Chairman, Shepro. Uh, Mr. Shepro, if I have just one moment, I have one more comment to make. And hang on one second. Um, the other thing are is the technical aspect. Uh, here there are requirements for temperature. Um, everyone has to take their temperature going into an office. Right now we have the uh, availability of the deputy downstairs who takes our temperature. Um, if that individual is going to be um, no longer there, let's say by the end of May, I've heard that may be happening. How is that protocol going to be enforced? So this includes for um, a self-check. So there's no specific enforcement of it um, to screen people. So you don't have to have staff screening people. CDC guidance just um, 
indicates that you should give them a protocol to self check, um, preferably in the morning before they leave or to provide them the ability to do that before they enter the building. But there's no necessity in that protocol for them to be checked by a staff person and not let in. So. Um, for example, I believe the health department currently uses a protocol where people self check and then um, submit something electronically that says, I don't have a temperature today and I don't have any symptoms today. So they attest to that um, daily electronically. So it's not necessary to have someone screening people, but rather the employees have to attest that they have screened themselves. Okay. And I have, I have one more question then I'll be done. Uh, vaccinated individuals, um, as far as those individuals who may have been in contact with somebody who has COVID-19, but has been vaccinated. Um, I believe from what I've heard, obviously uh, double check with that, that time that you have got to self quarantine is very limited compared to an individual who has not yet been vaccinated. So current guidance indicates that someone who has been fully vaccinated and fully vaccinated would mean they've received, um, if it's a two course vaccine, both courses of the vaccine and at least two weeks have passed since the second vaccination, that those people may return to work immediately as long as they have no symptoms of the virus. And so that's included um, under the bullet of those who have had close contact with someone, when can they return? A uh, fully vaccinated individual may return immediately. Mr. Chairman Bates, after Shepro. I'll defer. I, I, um, I don't see. Wait, wait, Corrine is not I, done, I, hang on. I, I don't see that, I'm just looking. Um, Those who if you go back to someone. the um, exhibit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at. Yeah, I was hoping you could go up there. So if you look at the mm -hmm. second arrow um, near the top, those who had close contact with someone. Right in the middle of the page. Down a little further with your arrow. There you go. And so that second um, arrow pointing in, it says those who had close contact with someone, that first bullet point below it, the following may return immediately, someone who has been fully vaccinated and has no symptoms of COVID-19. All right, I, I still don't see it, but uh, I'll find it after. I won't hold this up. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Ken, did you have something, sir? No, I'll defer. Mavis? We're already running behind, I think. Okay, here's my can of worms for you. Are we going to require vaccination? And I think we should. I don't know that that was addressed here. We're currently not planning. That's a very complicated planning. legal question. I said it was a can of worms, but it's Hang still... on, hang on, hang on. I believe on the current advice from the mm. state's attorney, we are not planning to require vaccination. Are we not allowed to require vaccination according to the state's attorney? Um, no, actually, this is Jamie Mosser. I'm on Zoom. Ooh. I'm Jamie. <laughs> Thank you all. So the law mm -hmm. says that we can in certain situations. So this is a much longer conversation than what we can do right now. But upon a discussion of it, we had decided that uh, we were not going to mandate uh, our employees having to have the vaccine. Why? For a lot of reasons. Um, May I and, offer one? Yes. Mavis, if you don't, the, the, the cases that have been decided in, in similar situations, this is Shepro, by the way. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Shepro. Is um, <laughs> that if you're going to require it, then you have to provide an opportunity for the unvaccinated people to be assigned other work where the vaccination is not necessary. And that could be extremely complicated. You can't just say, take, be, get the shot or you're fired. Correct. Um, legally, we would have to look at other accommodations, what we could provide to the employees. Um, and that could include continuing the work from home um, there's a lot of things that you have to look at through the EEOC. You have to look at things through the American Disabilities Act, uh, see if there's civil rights issues with this. And there's a lot of case law, and I'd be happy to talk to you about that one-on-one -on -one in regards to it. 
Um, and frankly, obviously, there this is while a tested drug, it has not had a long time in terms of testing. So there's a lot of possible legal implications down the road. And then frankly, it's something that makes a lot of issues for our employees if we're forcing them to do something that they're not necessarily um, comfortable with. So my recommendation is if you want to talk about this further, we can set up a time to do so and I can walk okay. through the law. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mavis, Thanks, that was David. an excellent question and I thank <laughs> you for bringing up and it was categorized properly as a can of worms. So <laughs> okay. Jamie, thank you for chiming in. Ken, we appreciate your expertise as well. Always. With that, can we have a motion? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Martin. I have a comment. The, the Turn your mic on. Thank you. Um, there's, there's, if you read between the lines here, they talk about um, uh, a telework policy to be signed by all employees who participate in telework. Uh, we, we, in the past, have had uh, discussions that bordered on being a kerfuffle. Uh, relative to people working remotely. And I think that if, if you talk to the department heads in certain circumstances, remote working is in fact proven to be a, 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 a plus for production and otherwise. And I just wanna make certain that the verbiage in here doesn't imply that mm -hmm. you have to physically be back in the office. For example, the, the, the reference of return to work. Well, it would be return to, you know, f return to work in county offices or something. And I don't know if it's this is the place to talk about remote work. Uh, if if this is so, Jamie, the is there work. anything in this document that is <clears throat> suggesting a forcible return to physical? No, I, I think that was part of um, sending this to the departments department to heads. develop their own policies. That some departments lend well to telework, while others don't. It really is is very it varies so much between the many departments that we have in the county. So. Um, we did not specify that they have to end telework. Um, and that's why we included that if they are going to telework, it is best practice for them to have a policy in place um, for that telework for their employees. So if they wanna continue telework, that's absolutely within their rights to do that. But we'd like them to have a policy in place for that telework as I understand many of the departments do. Um, but again, this guidance would encourage them to, to get a policy in place if they're gonna continue telework. So department by department. John, does that help you? Super. Kareen? Uh, Jamie, who's going to approve <laughs> the department's policies? Oh, great is it, question. Is that something you're going to be reviewing? Is that going to come to this committee? I, I think it would come back to this committee. Am I mistaken there? Um, well, the departments of you know elected officials, um, I believe, can instill their own policies if they wish. But um, any policies for county departments would need to come through committee. Michelle, are you okay with that? You can just go thumbs up, that's fine. Yes, the elected officials have complete internal control over their offices. There you go. Dictate policy to them. Uh, with respect to the departments, um, you could tell the departments to do whatever it is that you want them to do. It, it's a process that can be developed by you. They could uh, present it to this committee, human resources, whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah, they reached, Kareem, they reached out to us. We're mm -hmm. trying to facilitate their request. So I think we're all in good with this right now. Oh, I, I agree. But I think uh, prudent policy would be to have them draft their own unique policies, make sure that it does incorporate some of these best practices, if not all the best practices here, and then customize it according to their own individual needs. Perfect. That would be the intent. And we need to have, a, I, I think we all need to have a copy of that so that we can take a look at it and review it. So if, if, you know, Jamie, I, for your department, I, I would encourage that somehow a finished draft from each department makes its way to a master file for our review. Is that? Would you like me to include a provision um, at an, an edit to this before the next step that includes that they are required to return that um, finished plan? I think that would committee? be appropriate. Yes. Okay. Okay. With that said, Mr. Kenyon. The phrase, let's all be on the same page. Uh, comes to my mind. So one department wants to open, one doesn't want to open. Wouldn't it be nice if we said the whole county's open for business? We're in business now. We're open for business, not you don't have to go 
to a phone and say, well, the health department's not open, transportation's not, but we can go to human services. If you have so to we're differentiate need to be all together on this eventually. <clears throat> The elected officials can set arguably well, their is, this, that. is that Mr. Shepro trying to chime in? Yes, Shep, I understand that. Yeah. But I'm talking about the county. Understood. Yeah. And I'm also thinking if if you want people to get a shot, you you give them time off if they need it. But if they don't get the shot and they have to have a time off, it's it's without pay. There has to be something to I think yeah. I think that's something that the state's attorney is better to address because well, it I does know. open up the, the same American with Disabilities Act concerns. No, I you know what can. farmers things are important, so we appreciate that. If you if you want time off with pay, you've got to play the game. I, I don't know how to legally instill that. So the document that we have, Deb, can I get a motion to accept this and move it forward? Move. Yes. I'll move it. Kenyon moves. Eight Eight seconds. Second. Sure. Any additional discussion? So we're going to move this forward with the two recommendations that will be included in the next committee. Correct? Correct. When you say Shepro question, when you say move it forward, move it forward to the your next meeting with review by the No, move it to executive. Attorney, move it to exec. Move it to exec. Would you repeat the recommendations, please, that we're approving? The edits would be one to include a provision regarding um, the COVID pay, if that's approved, um, to allow that to be incorporated. And the other one would be to return each department to return a finished plan to this committee for approval. That's my understanding as well. But we are continuing to let the different departments make their own pace and um, plan. Correct. Okay, I agree with that. Thank you. Call the roll, please. Allen. Allen, aye. Bates. Bates, aye. Davis. Davis, yes. Kenyon. Yes. Lewis. Lewis, yes. Passes. Thanks, Anita. All right, Michelle, who, the, the young man that is with you this afternoon, this morning, are we in the afternoon already? Yeah, are we, are we on to the ethics ordinance? We are on to the ethics ordinance. The ethics ordinance. I'd like to introduce one of our newest members of the civil division, Vince Coyle. He comes to us from the criminal division after eight years, after 10 years uh, in their criminal division. So we're really happy and excited to have uh, him join us. Uh, we've asked him as one of his first civil assignments to tackle and assist the this committee uh, and the county board with revising the ethics ordinance at the request of uh, various board members. Um, so he has put together a draft. Um, we expect this would be a multi-meeting type of process. So he's just going to give a very brief introduction. If you have any questions, great. Um, but otherwise, we will be accepting comments and then presenting in more in full with, with people's comments and accepting more comments next meeting. Okay, and, and again, your name, sir? Vincent Coyle. Vincent, and is this your first meeting with us? It is, yes. <laughs> Welcome aboard, my friend. Thank you, very excited. Nice and, fire, and, and you have the unenviable task of, of grabbing onto a topic that will probably, as, as Michelle mentioned, stretch multiple meetings everybody will want to give input on. The goal today is just to introduce this so that we can begin dialogue and focus in a direction. I've already had, you know, a handful of phone calls. What about this? What about that? So if you could just briefly put us into what we have, what we perceive the problem to be, what the solution might be and where we're going. Absolutely. Um, so looking at the ethics ordinance, uh, as you said, our intention today is just to disperse the um, first markup that we did and also included with that uh, first markup was um, some general notes and comments that um, are added so you could see kind of where we're going with this uh, revision. Um, and, and also know that when looking at this revision, part of it was looking at the prior um, amendments that the prior state's attorney's office has recommended as well. Um, 
going through this ethics ordinance, uh, a few of the major uh, or fundamental changes um, that you should look at when reviewing this, um, and this is because of new laws and statutes that have been created. So this is uh, an amendment to keep up with those laws. Um, uh, one of them is in regards to a gambling and cannabis uh, ownership interest. Um, so there is in 2019, um, and actually the cannabis uh, control interest will go into effect June of this year, uh, in which this law establishes an officer's ability to have ownership interest in those type of businesses. Um, as you know, in Illinois, gambling and cannabis uh, in, um, businesses are, are growing. Um, and there is a law now on that the statute or the state has passed regarding an officer's ability to have ownership interest in those businesses. Um, also, uh, a new uh, addition that we made to the ethics ordinances regarding sexual harassment. Now, understanding that there is a employee handbook policy that the county does have on sexual harassment, um, but one of the items that we included in the ethics ordinances is there's a statute in place uh, regarding uh, when an elected official makes a uh, claim or complaint of sexual harassment against another elected official. Uh, it wouldn't be uh, proper to put that in the employee handbook because this is dealing with uh, elected officials. Um, as you indicated, one of the problems that the prior state's attorney's office had uh, seen um, and made a recommendation um, uh, for the committee to be open-minded and in, in putting in place a ethics commission to handle all uh, complaints, uh, investigations, and hearings. Uh, the purpose of creating an ethics commission would to alleviate any conflict of interest that the state's attorney may have. Currently, the ethics ordinance does have that the state's attorney would be uh, the uh, person that would handle those investigations, but the conflict of interest that could arise from this uh, would be that the state's attorney would have to represent the same person that they are investigating if an ethics uh, complaint is made. Um, so creation of an ethics um, commission is strongly recommended um, by the attorney general's uh, model ordinance. Um, it would be also recommended by uh, the state's attorney's office to create an ethics commission because that would alleviate um, some of those issues. That's an issue of policy. It's not required by uh, law, um, but it is included in the ethics uh, attorney general model. And uh, obviously there can be flexibility as to what that, um, the makeup of that uh, ethics commission. Um, looking just generally throughout this, I, in my notes, indicated different sections that are affected by the ethics ordinance. Um, there's definitions that I tried to go through and, and mark uh, for this committee to identify which ones are actually from the statute itself. Others are not. Um, but uh, uh, other than those fundamental changes, um, there's really just language uh, adjustments um, and cleanup to, for more clarity. So that's kind of the overview of what we were doing when looking at the Ethics Commission. And, um, our intention today was just to disperse that, let this committee know, um, kind of just the general outlook uh, for discussion in the future. Thank Vincent, you. just so you're aware, um, when I was asked to chair this committee a few, a few years ago, one of the first things that we tried to uh, address was not dissimilar than this, and, and Mark Davist was kind enough to volunteer to take poll position on it. And, and I think Mark and I will both agree that this is the most thankless job in the world trying to do this. <laughs> when you open that PDF file and you try and search for a word, you're expecting it to take you to one section. And the, re the reality is it pulls up 75 sections. And then you realize the spider web where we have laid Band-Aid over Band-Aid over Band-Aid over Band-Aid instead of just having it in one clearly defined referenced area. Um, please be patient. We understand that. Rome wasn't built in a day. We will get this down where we need to have it. We're going to bump our head. We're going to get upset with the red line versions. We're we get it. Yeah, I mean, there's 24 of us plus Kareen. 
We're going to do the best that we can. You know, we appreciate your patience. And since this is your first one, yay. You know, you know um, Mark, am I mischaracterizing this at all? Um, I wish that you were, but um, <laughs> historically, you know, we, <laughs> Vincent, if you'd seen the very first one that was handed to me when I was sitting where Mr. Sergis is, it was, uh, I think, two and a half pages. And then Chairman McConaughey said, this is an embarrassment and we need an actual ethics ordinance. And here you go. Thank you very much. Um, what ensued was months of meetings and trying to you know, get our arms around it. The result was pretty much the one that we have now. And it's uh, from the moment we released it, it was under attack and scrutiny and lots of suggestions, but here it still is. Um, so it, it's not that it doesn't need work. That's it. You know, it clearly does, but it's never easy. Um, it, in your quick review there, I, you already brought one question to mind for me with the formation of an ethics commission. I'm just curious how that differs substantially from um, when a special counsel is assigned because of conflict. Because when you when you form a commission, that's a whole another kind of big layer. But yes. we can have. And there is nothing time, wrong, Vincent, we'll... with ever telling us. I will get back with you on that. Sure. Okay, yes. don't it... don't try and always answer something on the fly. While we appreciate that, there is nothing wrong with saying we'll get back with you. And and just so I'm clear, with this committee sitting in the center chair on this, there is no politics involved in this ordinance. This is something that we were asked to get updated. Um, th that that is politics free. We just need to, you know, take action to make sure that what we have in writing is is in line with other legislation that has come down and that we're updating it. So that that is the goal here. Um, that doesn't mean it's any easier. So, sorry. So yeah, I, Mr. I Chairman Shepro. Um, let's let Vincent answer Mark's question and then we'll come back to Ken and then we'll uh, try he, and wrap this he, up. He can answer me later for Perfect. the sake of brevity Perfect. of the meeting. We can, we can chat later about that. Ken, let's go. <laughs> uh, well, for the sake of brevity of the meeting, I would just note uh, one, uh, Mr. Davis' uh, description of the long saga that led to this or ordinance didn't cover the subsequent long process to amend it, which took, I think, the yeah. same amount of time and ended up being rejected by the board. So there yeah. is a long history on this. Um, as I recall, there is a detailed analysis, almost line by line, that the state's attorney's office, the previous state's attorney's office had prepared um, and it just occurred to me that that document might be helpful to have in conjunction with the new proposed draft so that you're not only seeing the ch changes. I haven't seen the new draft, so maybe it's covered, but it seemed to me it, it was helpful to be able to not only see what the proposed revision is, but why there were concerns about the existing language. So if that's available, I, I would urge that that be distributed. Duly noted. Um, May I ask a question? Yes, ma'am. I, I would like to know what the process of this is going to be. Are we going to be reviewing it in this committee line by line, or is there going to be a subcommittee formed that can bring recommendations to this committee? I don't know that we're there yet. My goal was to introduce it in discussion today, which, which we're doing now. I am happy to, you know, I think that this can't be done during a normal committee session. So maybe we have a special committee meeting, which is only about this and, and invite whoever would like to participate in that to come so that we can get this going. And then within the next 60 days, actually have a document that we can bring to committee, take a, res, you know, a vote on the resolution, move it forward to executive and go from there. If that would, uh, Michelle, you tell me if that's not acceptable. 
Okay. Matt, Madam Chair, that, that would be my suggestion is uh, not a subcommittee, but a special committee meeting. Which will be happening monthly? Um, I think that we could probably, uh, depending on the turnaround time from the state's attorney's office, I think once we hammered in that hour or hour and a half long session back to them, we would be able to respond to that. If that takes a week, yay, but if that's you know 90 days to get that information back because they have to go research other items, um, we could answer it there. Is there something you'd rather do or? Um, I was just thinking that perhaps we could uh, have a designated committee who would be doing this work and then presenting it to the committee. Uh, I'm just concerned uh, as much as I uh, love having multiple voices, having the potential of 25 voices on this thing may make for a very lengthy, interesting discussion. Davis, did you just volunteer? I'm sorry. Did I? Yeah, I heard, yeah. I heard I'm sorry, I was a little quiet there. Um, the, uh, you, you outlined the method that was used before basically, Cliff, which was that it, it really falls to this standing committee. Um, and it took as many meetings, you know, we had special meetings. It was just, it was calling the human services committee together, you know, for special meetings as needed. Uh, and you're absolutely right. It depended on how quickly the information we needed from the last one to be answered, you know, came back into us. Um, we always invited any other board member to participate. We had some participation, but for the most part, the, the rest of the board kind of wanted us to do what they saw as our job and come back to them with a, a close to finished product. Um, Mark, if, I, if I may, Madam Chair, if you would indulge us to let's have a special meeting to get our legs under us. Absolutely. If we believe that it's beyond our scope, let's call it an ad hoc to I, do it with. Mr. That would be Mr. Chairman, Shepro. Yes, sir. I, I, Mark could correct me, but I believe that at that time there was also for the period the ethics ordinance was being considered, there was a staff member in the office of the board chairman who was almost exclusively devoted to turning out draft after draft and research on uh, all of the, uh, all of the issues related to that, which involved a tremendous amount of work and research. You are correct. Let me introduce Vincent. I, I think we had Barb Garza from staff that was devoted to the effort uh, pretty exclusively for quite some time. Hopefully we're not, uh, let, if, if we can set this that I, I believe we have a, uh, unfortunately we have a, a special um, committee, uh, human services com need for a special human services committee coming up. Um, we can discuss this at that meeting on dates and times that might work with everybody. Um, and, and we'll invite Vincent back. And, and if we could take it from, I believe that meeting would be within the next few days, the next five days. So if th that will give us more than an appropriate amount of time to respond. To organize this. Yes, if that's okay good. with you. Perfect. If you. Is that okay with the committee? Yes. Any yes. nays? Yes. Perfect, yes. perfect. Yes. perfect. Okay, could I have a motion to replace the, Vincent, thank you so very much and welcome again. Thank you. Um, if we could have a motion to place the reports on file. Bates moves. Lewis seconds. There we go. Roll call, please. Allen. Allen, I. Bates. Bates, I. Kenyon. I. Lewis. I. Reports are on file. Okay, I see. I see two. I see Jamie at the podium. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. Davis. <laughs> sorry. Okay. I love um, reports. We did uh, skip over the resolution regarding the um, harassment policy. That's number E under new business. I don't know if that was intentional or if you wanted to address that or table it. E is the ethics ordinance that we no, just. No, the um, amending the employee policy handbook section that's prohibiting harassment. I also passed out a red line version and emailed it. Thank 
Jamie, unfortunately, the agenda that I'm working from does not have that. There was an up, I don't know where I grabbed that one from when I. It's the very last, it, it's up here. I'm not sure where that printed one. A lot of versions went through, that is, but it, if that. Just so everybody knows, that is not what I have in front of me, but let's, Jamie, let's go to resolution under item 9E. I'll leave that one up to you to introduce. Mr. Chairman, this may be a resolution that might be particularly good for a special meeting. We have received some comments from board members regarding this topic in terms of just the reporting of harassment types of complaints. We could take another look at that to see if we need to beef up some, some areas in that regard. Um, after Jamie introduces it, if you think that that would be appropriate, we'd be happy to look at that so we could you know, suggest any additional changes for your special meeting. You know what? I think that's an excellent suggestion. Yes. Could we motion to table this and we, and we, that we may take up in special meeting? Bates moves. Second. Kenyon Alan second. I, I don't think that that's a roll call. Is that a roll yeah. call? Yeah. Yes. Let's roll call it. It is. We'll call it. Alan. Alan, I. Bates. Bates, I. Davis. Davis, yes. Kenyon? Yes. Lewis? Lewis, yes. Thank you. Perfect. And I do apologize. Now it kind of tells me why I've been one off the whole day. I'm working off an agenda. What over your schedule? Yeah, I'm so sorry. It's not okay. Um, I don't believe we have any executive session needed at this time. Um, motion to adjourn. Move we adjourn, Kenyon. Davis, second. second. Perfect. Second. Anyone opposed? <laughs> I thank you all for the lengthy meeting. I appreciate everybody's indulgence. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.